and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hey, everyone. And Steve Marinucci, probably the world's only remaining full-time Beatles reporter. You can read his work in Axis.com, that's AXS.com, and Billboard.com, and Variety, Goldmine, and you name it. How's it going, Steve? I'm doing well. Uh, Thank you, Alan. Hello, everyone. And we're joined today by an old pal of all of ours, Bruce Spizer, uh, the author of um, eight million books about the Beatles <laughs> and uh, basically anything you want to know about their Capitol recordings, their Apple recordings, uh, and uh, their first visit to the U.S. I mean, lots of great books that are really uh, musts for everyone's bookshelf. Hey, Bruce, how's it going? Doing all right. Glad, glad to be here. And Bruce, as many of you may know, lives in New Orleans, and in this past week, on October 24th, Fats Domino died, uh, and Fats was, apart from a massive influence on the Beatles, and an artist who covered a few Beatles songs himself, was, you know, probably one of the, I guess, central musical figures of New Orleans musical history. So we thought we would have Bruce on to chat with us about Fats and his influence on the Beatles, his influence in New Orleans, and, uh, you know, just generally. Uh, And you may have seen a story that Steve wrote this week on Access.com, in which he actually uh, interviewed Bruce um, about some of these things. And um, if you haven't read it, um, you should look it up after the show. Uh, we'll probably try to, <laughs> try to fill in some things that uh, you know, may have ended up on the cutting room floor or otherwise. So, um, Bruce, the Beatles actually met Fats Domino in New Orleans, didn't they? Yes, and when the Beatles were setting up their tour of America, North America, 1964, There were a lot of venues they played that you would have expected, the big cities, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New York area, and things like that. But the Beatles picked two smaller markets because they wanted to see the places on the naive belief that they could actually go out in public and hang around. And two of those were Las Vegas and New Orleans. They even went so far as to have a day off scheduled for September 17th, the day after their September 16th concert in New Orleans. But that got canceled when Charles Finley of the then Kansas City Athletics offered the Beatles a guarantee of $150,000 to play in Kansas City, even though he knew he would lose money on the deal. Bruce, Uh, didn't didn't he... uh wasn't that the, like his third offer? Didn't he offer uh, fifty thousand, then went up to a hundred, and then went up to one hundred fifty? Is that according to the, one of the stories I read this week? Is that true? Yeah, there were. He kept up in the amount, and finally, when he got to one fifty, you know, Brian, rather than insisting that his boys had a vacation day, <laughs> went ahead and asked the group, and John said, "Brian, whatever you want to do is fine with us." Then Brian thought one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, let's do it, and <laughs> that was that. So. They missed that scheduled day off in New Orleans, but they still wanted to meet uh, some of the New Orleans legends. In particular, on their wish list was that uh, Fats Domino, and they were able to, uh, his people apparently track Fats down, and Fats did show up at City Park Stadium in their photographs of Fats, uh, you know, backstage um, in the, I guess, room or trailer or whatever it is, sitting around with the Beatles. Is and, that, that uh, the picture with the um, star-shaped watch? Yeah, and they, they're each on guitar. You know, you have, I think, George and John maybe holding their guitars. I don't have the yeah. picture in front of me, but that's the main picture you see yeah. uh, of the meeting. And, uh, you know, the, the, of course, the famous line was that Fats was asked uh, if he got to meet the Beatles when they were in New Orleans, to which he replied, no, they got to meet me. 
And, you know, you might listen to that and say, well, gee, Fats is being kind of conceited and all. No, that wasn't what Fats Domino was about. He was merely, as as we would say in New Orleans, telling it like it is Mm -hmm. to get in the Aaron Neville song. And essentially, Fats knew how much it meant for the Beatles to meet him. Uh, You know, they told him about, of course, how he had influenced uh, their music, how much they loved, uh, you know, New Orleans music. And, you know, in the U.K., there was an opportunity for the Beatles to hear a lot of, uh, you know, American singles because uh, Brian, when he was running NEMS, had this policy of ordering one of every record. And you had record labels in the U.K., such as Oriole and Stateside and other ones, putting out U.S. recordings, and the Beatles would love to go over to Brian's store after it had closed and go through the new songs and pick out the American ones. I mean, some of these labels even had on the label an American recording, so I'm sure they probably played everything that had that uh, thing on it. So, you know, it was it was a real honor for the Beatles to, to meet Fats, and, uh, you know, and as far as updating things locally, since after... Uh, Steve and I spoke. The New Orleans Saints had a home game in which they defeated the Chicago Bears on Sunday. The score is not the point for this. The point here is that the New Orleans Saints on their helmets had the word fats on the back of their helmet right yes. across from the American flag. Oh, cool. Black. Cool. Uh, I hadn't, Sean, heard, I hadn't yeah. heard that. Yeah, and their coach, Sean Payton, on his windbreaker had Fats Domino and some musical notes. And in the New Orleans Superdome, uh, they played Fats Domino's recording, of course, of When the Saints Go Marching In, and other Fats Domino songs during the breaks. And, you know, also, um, you know, the fans were asked to, uh, you know, salute Fats. So it was a wonderful thing. And Sean Payton, the Saints coach, explained how much he loved Fats Domino's music and how important it was. And he even took time during their week of practice to explain to the players of the New Orleans Saints who may have been too young to know what Fats Domino was about, his importance and some Fats Domino music was played at the New Orleans Saints practices and meetings. Mm -hmm. Wow. So in the story about the Beatles meeting Fats, um, he had to be found, right? I mean, they, they said they wanted to meet him and someone from NEMS, I guess, was dispatched to go find him. Was that how it worked? That's what we've heard. There are a few different versions of the story. One of them is that, you know, the roadies, uh, somebody went out to try to find him and uh, found him in the grocery store in the Ninth Ward. That's possible. Uh, Another story was that Paul actually went along and met with him at his house and then he came back. I don't know if that's necessarily true because I think Paul recently would have mentioned that it had gone down that way. Of course, you know, it was a long time ago, over, what, over 50 years, so... We may never know exactly how it was arranged. We have photographic evidence that Fats was in a backstage dressing room with the Beatles. That we do know. Mm -hmm. Paul did did mention the grocery store. Yeah. In there. And, I mean, you could see it because Fats did cook and, uh, you know, he was a homebody. Uh, He did some touring in the 50s, you know, uh, with his records and the like. But he liked staying home. He never went Hollywood. He didn't move out of New Orleans. He had this house in the lower ninth ward of New Orleans that, you know, flooded every time you had a really bad hurricane, like Hurricane Betsy and Hurricane Katrina. Mm. Particularly in Katrina, Fats lost his gold records and many other things uh, due to uh, the storm. But it was a remarkable house. He had a sofa that had on the left and right sides Cadillac fins. So (laughs) it was a, a very interesting place. And he did, in fact, have a pink Cadillac. Uh, with gold trim. I remember when Fats Domino played the Blue Room at the Roosevelt Hotel. I went to one of those performances and the pink Cadillac was parked out front. And I was fortunate enough to have a table fairly close to the stage. And, um, you know, he always had that smile on his face when he did those songs and the twinkle in his eyes. And you could tell how much he enjoyed it. And, you know, he played it straight just like the records. And his musicians in the band played the saxophone and other solos pretty much like the records. And, you know, it was a really enjoyable, fun, uplifting experience to see him in concert. I saw him multiple times, but I think the Blue Room one was I remembered best because, you know, I was closest to the stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Did you hear anything, Bruce, about when the Beatles met Fats? There was an article that I read where there was a quote from John where he said that they did like a sing-along with him. Is there anything to confirm that? I mean, it looks in the picture like they were doing something along those lines. So, you know, that wouldn't wouldn't surprise me. And, you know, John was very disappointed. I mean, he was happy he met Fats, but he was disappointed that he didn't get to see more of New Orleans. I think at the press conference in Kansas City, they were asked if there were any, you know, cities on the tour that they wish they had gotten to see. And I think John was the one who said New Orleans for one. So... You know, imagine the frustration for them of being in New Orleans and not really getting to see anything except for the Congress Inn on Chef Tour Highway and fortunately getting to see Fats backstage in the dressing room. Mm. I did see something on Facebook where May Pang said that when she was with John that they went to see Fats in concert in Las Vegas. Yeah, that's cool. Mm. You know, and, and you know, Fats, uh, you know, Paul had said that Lady Madonna was heavily influenced by Fats Domino. Some people have gone as far to say, well, in Fats' song Blue Monday, they you know, have days of the week and Lady Madonna has days of the week. I don't I don't know if it was lyrical, it certainly was musically influenced and vocally influenced in many ways. And uh, you know, Fats of course returned the favor by recording Lady Madonna on one of his reprise albums. And in addition, um, Fats also recorded Lovely Rita for Sgt. Pepper. And everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. So uh, certainly Fats return the favor. Yeah, it's actually a very interesting recording of everybody, Everybody's Got Something to Hide. Kind of funky, and I love the, the piano playing that he does on there. Yeah. You might not think that's a song that would fit him, <laughs> but it does work very much so. Oh, yeah. I've always liked the Lady Madonna version. I thought that just it was so perfect for him to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it should be mentioned to anybody that doesn't know that those recordings are still available. Rhino Handmade put out a collection of the entire uh, his entire reprise output, including a couple of unreleased tracks. It's called Sweet Patootie, the complete reprise uh, recordings, um, and it's on Amazon. They have a digital for about uh, thirteen bucks, but the CD is like twenty eight, which isn't. I I thought it was going to be a lot more than that. But yeah, uh, it's, it's well worth getting. I got it uh, when it um, came out. And then, you know, for those who really want to jump into Fats, the Bear Family collection of all his uh, Imperial recordings on, I think it's eight CDs, is, uh, is well worth it. Uh, oh, wow. You know, obviously, after Fats died, I started listening to it. I had to take a couple of road trips. I was up at the Louisiana Book Fair in Baton Rouge. And on the way up and back, I, you know, played a bunch of those Fats Dominoes. CDs played some in the car today, and you know the consistency and quality of the recordings. I mean, there's some that are a little poppy and you know ill-advised and strings added, but for the most part, it's just wonderful, consistent R&B, rock and roll. You know, whatever you want to call it. Even the one he did after Katrina, Alive and Kicking, uh, is is really good. I pick. I just picked that up yesterday, actually, and I was kind of surprised at how good it was i i did not expect that it would be as good as it was and you're right that's one thing about him that's uh that's all the way through his career he was very consistent very yeah. consistent yeah really i mean you know starting back with what 1949 with the fat man recorded at cosmos j and m studios on rampart street and uh mm-hmm. you know on those recordings i mean you know it's when you talk about the beginning of rock and roll you talk about of course the, the later sun recordings and Certainly, I think you need to talk about Louis Jordan, who in turn influenced Fats Domino in many ways, or, you know, the Barrow House style piano players before Fats. But I think in him, I mean, a lot of the elements really came together, and it was remarkable that this was recorded essentially on one track where a microphone, you know, would be placed and trying to pick up the ambient sounds in this room of Fats on piano and, you know, a couple other musicians with saxophone and, uh, stand-up bass and gets a little bit of guitar work and different things and there's something very magical about those um recordings dave bartholomew who was his initial producer and then there was about a year or so when the head of imperial records and bartholomew were in a fight and he didn't produce fats but once he got back with fats you know it was just an incredible thing um you know fats had sold at one point they had determined 25 million records primarily on the r&b market 
had tons of RMD hits, and then of course he began to cross over to the pop charts, which was, uh, you know, even when you had other people covering his songs, such as Pat Boone or the like, Fats Domino was still charting with his songs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which would you say, Bruce, that that was the start of rock and roll? A record it, it, like the Fat Man. I mean, if it wasn't the start of rock and roll, I don't know what else would precede it. I mean, you could say that "Ain't That Just Like a Woman" by Louis Jordan certainly was an early rock and roll tune, particularly since the opening riffs on the song sound like it's something that Chuck Berry borrowed heavily from. Mm. You know, um, but I mean, it certainly was one of the first things to um, you know to do it. It had a lot of the key elements of what would become right. rock and roll. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and where, where the Beatles are concerned, John did say that Ain't That a Shame was the very first song he ever learned on guitar. Yeah, and uh, you know, and of course he later recorded it, as did Paul. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. a, a great track, and on the Get Back sessions, on that Get Back bootleg, you know, of the warts and all version that was thrown together, where they're doing a little bit of jamming on one of the earlier tracks, uh, Paul is doing a bit of I'm Ready, uh, you know, the Fats Domino song. Mm-hmm. 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 They actually, uh, there, there's a, there's several recordings, uh, tribute recordings, out there that uh, I, I'm sure just about everybody knows about the, the I'm in Love Again, uh, with from the Klaus Vormann album with Paul and yeah. Ringo, mm-hmm. yeah, and the, right. and then the, um, the, the recordings that are on the uh, tribute album, um, to uh, Fats Domino called Going Home, uh, uh, which includes uh, Lennon's Ain't That a Shame, and also. Has Paul doing I Want to Walk You Home, an original version of I Want to Walk You Home with Alan Toussaint, who recorded with Fats, which I think is really kind of cool, too. Yeah, it is. And Alan Toussaint, a lot of people may not know this, but there was a time when Fats was on the road promoting his records. And sometimes uh, Lou Chud of Imperial would tell Dave Bartholomew, you know, let's get some backing tracks. And when Fats comes in, he'll sing them. And Alan Toussaint says, and there apparently is pretty good evidence to it, that he actually played piano on a couple of Fats Domino songs. Hmm. Not necessarily the big hits we know and love, but, you know, just to get the things going, that Toussaint would do the piano track with the band, and then Fats would come in later and overdub the vocal. Fats, I was listening to a BBC special today, and they said Fats played piano on, um, was it, um, I can't remember the song now. Lottie, Lottie, Miss Claudy. Is that what it was? He, well, he did a couple of he did a couple of uh, sessions for um, for uh, Dave Bartholomew when Bartholomew was its specialty. I think it was. was yeah, it special- that would, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, okay. Dave Bartholomew was his producer, so there'd have been no reason to do not to. But he he did the piano on Lardy Lardy Miss Claudy by mm-hmm. Lloyd Price, which was a uh, you know a really big hit, of course. Right. Right and yeah and and I think they I think the BBC special played that and it, the piano is kind of in the background you almost can't tell it's fat but you it there is a little distinct uh, um, flavor to the piano that uh, that is there um, Bruce tell me you said you'd seen you'd seen Fats several times I don't I'd yeah. only seen him once what did you notice about his shows Well I mean always um, you know they were I guess about an hour in length he had a really top notch band with him. And he always had a smile on his face, you know, and you could tell he was thoroughly enjoying getting up there and, and doing the hits. It was nothing flashy. He sat behind the piano, played the songs and sang into the microphone. It wasn't that, you know, he jumped up on stage or anything crazy like that. It was just fast behind the piano playing and singing. And, uh, you know, it was just about doing the music. He knew the fans wanted to hear the hits most of them were hits and then he did a few that might not have been big hits but were personal favorites of him he liked to do jambalaya he liked to do when the saints go marching in and then the ones you'd expect blueberry hill i'm ready you know i want to walk you home i'm going to be a wheel to someday pretty much all the big hits and some that he just had a personal fondness for whether or not they were big chart hits and he would finish with going home and that's when he would push the piano correct Yep. I mean, that was, you know, that was one of the very early big hits he had. Uh, you know, The Fat Man was the, the first recording. Going Home was a very early one and was a big R&B hit. Obviously didn't cross over to the pop charts at that time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as, as many people pointed out, you know, that for those who grew up on Happy Days and everybody mm-hmm. remembers Richie Cunningham, you know, Ron Howard in real life, 
you know, doing is I've got my thrill on Blueberry Hill, you know, right. my thrill. and right. that was strictly the Fats Domino version. I mean, the song was recorded by other people prior to Fats. I think his version was probably most influenced by the Louis Armstrong version of the song. Mm-hmm. Did you see? But he you made it his own. <laughs> did you ever see uh, Fats and Ricky Nelson together? No, I did not. Because yeah, because they did they did shows for I remember them doing shows I I didn't see them together but uh, I saw the show- I saw them separately but never together. The other ironic thing about Blueberry Hill was Fats was on tour and at the time that you know they got the idea of hey we need a new single let's get this recorded I think he was in L A and it was actually recorded in L A as opposed to New Orleans but it certainly has that New Orleans sound through and through. You know there there's the with with uh, Fats, you have to talk about the fact that pa- uh, Pat Boone and, and Nelson covered two of his songs, and the the impact that that had on the charts, and what you know why they did that in, in those days. You want to discuss a little of that? Um, you know, um, I mean, there was. I get. I, I was it. Was it a, a racism thing at the at the time, or what? Not that, so much racism. I think that artists would rush to cover a song that they felt would be a hit and in the case they might feel that um you know a record recorded by a black musician might not get play on the pop radio stations and therefore it was an opportunity for them to do so perhaps the craziest one you know when you've got you know somebody trying to record tutti frutti other than little richard you know (laughs) that's just not gonna work yeah Um, you know I think there was a, a great satire on Saturday Night Live where they had this, yeah, right. you know, group of white people recording uh, "What Did I Say" as opposed to <laughs> "What I Say" by Ray Charles. Yeah. That's you know really humorous, to put it mildly. I, I think that was the show that Ray Charles was, was a done. guest on, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah, it was great, great fun. Um, I think you know, there's one thing we 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 talked about John and Paul covering "Ain't That a Shame" and uh, Paul's "I'm in Love" with uh, from the Klaus Foreman sessions. Um, you had mentioned um, "I'm Going to Be a Wheel Someday," which Paul also recorded um, mm-hmm. uh, on the Russian album. Um, so those Russian album sessions must have had, you know, when we we know of at least the two Fat Domino songs that are on there. Uh, there mm-hmm. and there are probably others. Maybe during the session too, you know. And it wouldn't surprise me, you know, when Paul is doing warm ups with the band on tour that he, you know, may sneak in a few. And now, you know, with Fats passing, maybe Paul will be more inclined to, in concert, maybe go in and do, you know, a tribute to Fats and bring in some of his songs. Yeah. When he recorded in New Orleans in 74, did, did or, or he and Fats known to have met up then? I'm not aware of that. I, you know, obviously Alan Toussaint, but I'm not aware of a meeting with Fats. It doesn't say it didn't play, take place, but I'm not aware of any such meeting. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, when Paul toured uh, in 1989 and 90, he did perform Ain't That a Shame Life right. yeah. as, in his set list. And if you want more Fats Domino that Paul covered, he did Coquette huh. on the Run Devil Run album. Yeah. So, uh, you know. It's evidence right there of uh, how much Paul loves Fats music. Bruce, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can showcase how an artist is an influence. Obviously, covering their material is one way. Could you point to any of the Beatles recordings as a group, possibly, where you notice an influence in Fats Domino, other than Lady Madonna? Possibly in the piano playing or in any way? I mean, um, you know, I hadn't really thought of that in advance of this, so... You know, I, I just think it was more on the get back sessions where you had him knocking out I'm ready and things along that nature. But Lady Madonna being the most obvious influence, um, you know, with the saxophones and everything else that you would have heard on a Fats Domino recording in addition to uh, the piano. And, and the other thing about Fats that I really think needs to be said, there are a lot of rock and roll artists that were great musicians and we love their music and how they influenced everybody, and the Beatles and all. And one that comes to mind is Chuck Berry. Great influence on the Beatles. But a lot of people, if you ask them, if you met Chuck Berry, what do you have to say? There were a lot of negative things they might say. Mm -hmm. And people might say Jerry Lee Lewis was crazy, or you know, he had sex with his cousin who was a minor, and all kind of (laughs) other stuff. But I dare anybody to come up with anything negative about Fats Domino. 
Mm -hmm. Pat Domino was a family man. He had eight children with his wife. And all of them, as Paul pointed out, he was <laughs> fascinated by the fact that all of their first names began with the letter A. That was Antoine Domino. And so all his kids had that same A to start off their name. I mean, he was just a really classy person, uh, never left New Orleans, you know, didn't enjoy particularly going out on tour. But in those days felt you had to go out on tour to, you know, sell the records and you made some money on tour. But just a wonderful, classy person. And you're not going to hear that consistently about many of our favorite legends of rock and roll. Whereas Fats, I've, I've never heard anyone say a bad word about the man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our, and, our, know, our, he stayed with Imperial Records for a long time. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, when the hits started drying up, he did switch to other labels. But I mean, he could have uh, he could have left Imperial and gotten big contracts, you know, a long time before. But he stayed with Imperial because he appreciated what the label did for him and just felt comfortable staying there. He was a very loyal person. Mm-hmm. Are any of the recording studios that he uh, used in the early days, did they survive uh, all the storms in, in New Orleans? Well, they didn't survive that. <laughs> they were well before gone before that. In that, the original location of Cosmos was on, uh, you know, on Rampart, North Rampart. And mm-hmm. if you go there, there's a plaque on the wall where the studio was. It's a laundromat. <laughs> and, you know, clearly another was, ain't that a shame. There's, it's not like you can go to Cosmos, like you can go to Sun Studios, you know, when you, uh, you know, venture on up the river from where we are. There just isn't a Cosmos where you can go in and see where the magic took place. All you see is a little plaque on the wall, and that's it, and that's a shame. But, you know, nobody thought to preserve it, and uh, I guess somebody could try to recreate it from the photos, but I don't see that, unfortunately, happening anytime soon. Hmm. Anybody, uh, Alan, you got some? I was hoping that there was some information about Paul meeting him in New Orleans because there's, you know, when, when he when he did tour in 1989, his intro to "Ain't That a Shame" was, you know, he went to see Fats and Fats said, and it could have just been a setup to get into the first line of the song. But I was just wondering if um if there was any actual meeting there that anybody knew about, you know. It sounds like something he would do, you know. I mean, he's if he's going to be in New Orleans for a while, you would you would think that he would have tried to seek him out. Yeah, you would have thought. I know when Paul came down to New Orleans, a lot of times, you know, he would try to, you know, meet with Alan Toussaint, who unfortunately, you know, passed away earlier, um, you know, not that long ago. Uh, so it's, it's always sad when the great ones go. It's uh, but the nice thing about Fats is that. Uh, you know, you didn't get these conflicting reports. Well, you know, Fats Domino died. He was a great musician, but he was a jerk. It wasn't anything that. And, you know, to me, it really was special to go to a New Orleans Saints football game. And when I had my field glasses, I could see Fats on the helmet. I could see, you know, Sean Payton with the Fats Domino on the music notes and hearing Fats Domino's music piped in through the PA system. Yeah. It just really felt it felt right and a wonderful tribute to a wonderful man. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Do we know anything about uh, John or Ringo having spent any time with him? Now, other than with the Beatles, I'm not, uh, you know, aware. You know, obviously John going to see him perform in concert. I don't know whether John went backstage. Perhaps May Pang could, you know, elaborate on that, or maybe mm-hmm. John just, you know, was happy enough seeing Fats perform, which, quite frankly, would have been enough for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, after Fats passed away, I was doing some research on this for my live radio show, and I, I was trying to find out if the Beatles had covered any of Fats Fats's music in their early years when they performed. And going to Mark Lewison's book, The Beatles Live, he mentioned a couple of songs, but uh, he wasn't sure in the case of When the Saints Go Marching In, if the Beatles are really influenced by Fats's cover of the song or Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. So he mentioned both of them. And also he mentioned uh, the Sheik of Araby. Yeah. Which Fats Domino also did. But yes. then I've also heard that Joe Brown uh, had a version of that song that might have been the influential version on the Beatles. Yeah. So do, would you know in, in both cases? No, nah, I mean, uh, 
I wouldn't know. I think they would have been familiar with, with both versions of them, so it'd be hard to really say one way or another. Mm. Okay. You know, I mean, some songs are easy, you know. Kansas City, we know it wasn't Wilbert Harrison's song. They were influenced by the Little Richard recording of the song that had Hey, Hey, Hey in it already, and it was never a medley, although people, you know, for years called it a medley. What the Beatles recorded was Little Richard's version of Kansas City. Mm Mm-hmm which was not released by specialty as a single until after Wilbur Harrison had the single running up the charts in the U.S. And in the U.K., the Little Richard one was the one that got a ton of airplay or sold the most copies or whatever. So for that reason, when the Beatles did Kansas City, they did the Little Richard version of the song as opposed to the Wilbur Harrison version of the song. That one at least is clear. As far as the others, I really don't know one way or another. Mm. So there's nothing of Fats's in the Hamburg recordings or the BBC recordings, is there? No, no. not that I'm aware of, and that, and ain't that a shame because it would have been great to, you know, to hear them in those early days paying tributes to Fats, but you mm-hmm. know, for whatever reason, they're not there. Yeah, it's always interesting when you look back at the songs the Beatles chose to put on their albums that they covered, yeah. and there are so many artists still from the '50s that are not represented at all, like Mm -hmm. Elvis Presley, although they did it live and they did it for BBC Radio, but for EMI, they didn't do it. Same thing with Fats Domino. Yeah, and I I think one of the sad ironies of this is because of John and Paul's great songwriting, you don't get as many cover versions. That if John and Paul hadn't written so many great songs, you know, you wouldn't have had the Hard Day's Night album with all Lennon-McCartney songs that may have had, you know, the balance of, well, we'll have eight Lennon-McCartney songs and six cover songs. Because they were such great songwriters, we get less cover songs. And we can thank Capitol Records for the two Larry Williams songs that the Beatles recorded for Beatles 6, you know, Dizzy Miss Lizzie and Slow Down. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had those uh, chestnuts by the Beatles. Mm-hmm. So, and also, when, when you think yeah. about it, because of the fact that from well, from in sixty three and and sixty four, because the Beatles' schedules were so hectic, mm-hmm. they had the recording uh, the the recording dates in the studio. They had all the live dates. They had to make the movies in sixty four and sixty five. Because of the fact that they didn't have that much time, they didn't have as much time to write the original material, and that's also why we had the cover versions that we did. Apart yeah. from the fact that they were so good at doing it, and they had yeah. done it live anyway. I mean, I'm I'm really grateful that, you know, rather than the Beatles recording, you know, Love of the Loved and some of the other mediocre songs that they gave to other artists, that uh, they and George Martin and Brian or whatever realized those songs weren't strong enough to be Beatles songs. And rather than having, you know, I'm in love and stuff like that on their albums, you ended up with stuff like Please, Mr. Postman and Twist and Shout. Hmm. I kind of suspect that if they had recorded those songs with George Martin producing, they would have been better songs than we think of them as. Maybe so, but I, I there's only so much you can do with some of those songs. <laughs> oh, well. I don't know. I've come to appreciate those songs that, that the Beatles gave away more and more. And when you've got bands like the Weaklings covering them. Yeah. I was, I was, about to, I was thinking the same thing, that the, the Weaklings have given some of those weaker songs, as to make the obvious statement, a uh, you know, a, a better go of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And there's the band Apple Jam from Seattle that have covered those songs and, and gave it a Beatles arrangement. And it, it kind of works pretty well. Mm-hmm. So. Still, I'm glad they recorded all those rock and roll, you know, ones. <laughs> right. 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 Any uh, Anybody want to recommend some collection? I know, you, uh, Alan, you mentioned the Bear Family thing, but... Bruce you know, for people, yeah. for uh, or Bruce said, yeah, for people looking for... There's a single some- CD, there may be one or two compilations, I'm, I'm forgetting the titles of them, but you can find like one of them that'll have like, you know, don't get the cheap ones with, you know, Fats' best 12 songs. <laughs> I, mean, I have, I think, at least two different CDs that have about 27 or 8 songs, because the songs are very short, so on an 80-minute CD, you can pack it in, and those will pretty much have all the essentials, uh, You know, you may lose out on something great like the Rooster song or maybe Bo Weevil, but you'll get Ain't That a Shame, Blueberry Hill, Blue Monday, you know, on the absolutely essential songs. So there are plenty. I can think of at least two. I don't know their titles. 
But if you go to Amazon, I'm sure you can find them. I think one of the Single ones you're thinking of. Places. I think one of the ones you're thinking of is um, called "Walking to New Orleans." Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's got 30 tracks on it, and it's got a lot yeah. of good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple of imports too. That uh, Real Gun Music has a four CD set that um, has eight albums on it, and uh, Documents has a, a ten CD track that has twelve albums on it. Yeah. But those are, I mean, those aren't released through, uh, those aren't, you know, American things. Those are import things. And yeah. uh, so, you know, but you can certainly find the American CD. And, and if you have the money for it, the Bear Family thing, not only is, you know, of course, the great music, but it also has a wonderful book along with it that gives you the session information as best they could determine and a nice history of uh, Fats <laughs> Domino. And, you know, I hadn't read the booklet in a while, but over the weekend, uh, you know, I went through the booklet again, and, um, you know, I don't regret that purchase at all. I didn't regret it when I bought it, and it gave me many, many hours of pleasure back then and many, many hours of pleasure this weekend to, to get through a time where, you know, it was sad. I mean, I knew he had Alzheimer's, and, uh, you know, we knew the end would come sooner or later, but, you know, it's always sad when you hear it. Mm. You Did know, he- and on my, on my iPhone, I mean, I had tons of different notices, Uh you know, the local stations were the first to report it. Then, of course, the Washington Times, I mean, the New York Times, Washington Post, and, you know, everybody was reporting it. So it was it was big news, and my phone kept beeping. And, of course, I had a lot of text messages and emails from people letting me know in case I was busy practicing law that fats had passed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the news went really crazy that day. I mean, it was it, – we were getting all sorts of – notes about that it was um the reaction was uh, it was really nice to see the reaction from all sort all corners about about his passing that everybody cared so much about him that uh, that was really that was really good yeah and as i pointed out earlier the one thing you never heard was someone saying yeah he was a great musician but he was a jerk i mean you, you just never heard that never a negative thing about fats yeah mm-hmm. that was yeah. That, that was really nice that was really nice I think a lot of people would be surprised if, if you're, you know, a youngster, as Ed Sullivan would say, just how big Fat Domino really was in the yeah. 50s and early 60s. Because if you were to take a look at the Billboard singles charts, they say that next to Elvis Presley, he was the biggest selling singles artist. And he had more chart singles than anybody, you know, next to Elvis. Yeah, so, and, uh, and he it's, dominated the R&B charts. Uh, for a spell, you know, not quite the dominance Lewis Jordan had in the 40s, but still it was a really dominant thing. When you look at the charts, the number of uh, number ones and top ten hits that Fats Domino, you know, was churning out. And all of them just wonderful quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just have a double album on vinyl of uh, the best of Fats Domino from from the 50s and 60s. And I love it, you know. There's just so well crafted songs and something about a two minute, two and a half minute yeah. pop song where you want to keep repeating it over and over. You can never get enough of it. So uh, as soon as the song ends, you want to hear it again. So yeah. that's what uh, you know. A lot of Fats' music is like that. One of the more interesting listening experiences I had going to work this morning. I've gotten to the later Fats Domino discs, and I was listening to the disc that had "Walking to New Orleans" on it, and it has two versions of it. The version without the strings and then the version with the strings and it's you know almost a little bit more moving without the strings but the funny thing about it was even though the strings were not on this recording i was listening to in my car in my mind i was hearing those strings because i've heard the song so many times with them Hmm. so you know it was really an interesting listening experience hearing those two back to back and you know of course what a wonderful song not his last you know, great song by any means, but one of the last big chart entries for him. Mm-hmm. Mm. So who was it that actually did the arrangement on all the, the, the 50s and early 60s hits? Was that Dave Bartholomew? Yeah, he was the you know producer, and he put the band together. Earl Palmer uh, played drums on some of the early things before he moved out to L.A. And I think, and I'm not positive this, but Earl Palmer may have ended up playing drums on blueberry hill because by then he was out in la by the time fats was out there recording it um but you just had uh you know and some great musicians earl palmer ended up being one of the legendary you know rock and roll drummers who's played on you know tons of number one hits by 
Phil Spector artists and many other things. And the ironic thing about it was when he first started out that people were criticizing his drumming style and saying that he's not a great drummer because he's doing this that's different. And, of course, he ended up being one of the most famous rock and roll drummers of all time. Mm. Dave really deserves a lot of credit oh, for those arrangements. No doubt, yeah. no doubt yeah. about it. I mean, he did one, and he did some great stuff on his own. Um, one of the more classic tunes he did, that's very politically incorrect, but he's African-American, so he certainly had the right to do it. Was the great track, very interesting. I don't think it was a big chart hit anywhere except New Orleans. It got a lot of play, and uh, you know, I remembered it well and was glad when I got a Dave Bartholomew collection, it was on it. Uh, by the way, Dave is still alive yeah. as we speak. He uh, is. I, I just saw that he's 98 years old. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. God bless him. It's amazing. And he, you know, and I was at a music seminar in New Orleans a few years back where he was the speaker. And he's still, you know, a while back. I don't know if he's still performing, but he was definitely performing in his, you know, 90s where he'd get a band together with some of the old musicians who are still alive and some of the younger cats that can play that type of music. And, you know, very, very entertaining. So, uh, you know, he wasn't a bad singer or showman, but. Of course, his real thing was, you know, being able to work with Fats Domino and just bring out the brilliance. They were just a wonderful team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bruce, did he perform much after Katrina, or was he or Fats, did he already have all no, his numbers by then? No, I mean, I know it was hitting because he was scheduled to play at the New Orleans Jazz Fest a couple of years after Katrina, and I remember getting there and I ran into a reporter for Channel Four WWL TV, a guy named Eric Paulson who got to know Fats through doing stories on him. And um, Eric said, you know, Fats uh, said he he doesn't want to perform because he just can't remember the words anymore and he doesn't want to perform if he can't do it right. And Eric said, I'm going out to his house to get him. And he came back with Fats and Fats walked up on stage and Eric introduced him and he waved to everybody and basically said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling well enough to perform. I wish I could. And you know, thank you for coming out here. And then after that, one of the other acts that the Jazz Fest had booked went on and played rather than Fats. And that was kind of, you know, a very sad and disappointing realization. And I talked to Eric about it and he said, no, he he really has gone down. And I think a few months later, there was something at Tipitina's, which is a nightclub named after the song Tipitina by Professor Longhair. And uh, Fats was being honored and he actually did form a couple of songs for that. But the the Jazz Fest one was really disappointing where, you know, all he could do was walk up on stage and wave. But, of course, he got a standing ovation for just showing up and waving to the crowd. Mm. Mm. But it was both, you know, exciting in the sense of that this man could command all that just being there, but sad that he wasn't able to perform the way he felt. You know, he had his standards and he felt, I don't care how much money they're going to pay me. I don't want the money if I can't give my fans the performance they deserve. Right. 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 Well, he would have been in his mid eighties by then. Right. And, um, yeah. So I think probably would imagine the, the audience would have been fairly understanding of that. They were, there was disappointment. There wasn't anger in the crowd. Yeah. Mm. Like I said, I never heard anyone say a bad word about fats. Yeah. Bruce was, was fats still overweight, very overweight towards the end. Was he always that way? I mean, he always was fat. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of miraculous that he lived to be 89 then. Yeah, well, you know, he only weighed, according to the song, 200 pounds. It wasn't like he weighed three or 400 pounds. Mm-hmm. He was short, and 200 pounds was a lot of weight back in those days if you were short. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, he, he was just a, an amazing musician, and it was nice to see the love from everybody uh, uh, wow. he, he really deserved it he really deserved it it's too bad he didn't get more of it you know before you know, one of the um, one of the things that always perplexed me and I always found disappointing was that Paul McCartney has never played the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Fest and I always thought how cool it would have been if you know Paul was there and while Fats Domino was up on stage performing that Paul would have jumped up with his bass guitar and joined Fats Domino for a song or two and what a thrill that would have been, not only to the audience, but what a thrill that would have been for Paul McCartney. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those two would have sounded so natural together. Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Is there a lot of video of fats around? I mean, I think there was the bit from Girl Can't Help It, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and but, about the film The Big Beat, that he actually wrote a song for it called The Big Beat. And I think there may be one other film. So Shake, there are ra- Shake Rattle, and Rock I, I, is what... Uh, and Actually, there were a couple of films. Shake, Rattle, and Rock was the first one he was in, and then he wrote a uh, the title song of The Big Feet, I believe it's the called. The Big Beat. The Big, big Beat. beat? Is the Big yeah, Beat? Yeah, that's okay. a song. A, a little bit contrived, but, you know, it was a movie title song. It wasn't... It wasn't Hard Day's Night or Help, but uh, it still wasn't a bad song called The Big Beat. Okay. Which was literally describing the big beat and, you know, Grandpa dancing and all that other stuff. Mm. There there has to be film from him on The Ed Sullivan Show, because he was on The Ed Sullivan Show. Right. Do you know if Fats ever spoke about all the artists that covered his material? And if there are any favorites of his, because ain't that a shame, apart from... John and Paul covering it. You've got Cheap Tricks version. Uh, you know, you've got Dave Edmonds covering "I Hear You Knocking," which was right, a huge the old hit. Smiley Lewis song. Yeah. Did he yeah, ever talk about that? Not that I'm aware of. And uh, you know, some of his songs, Dave Bartholium, it would would get you know where one of the other artists that he produced would do a song, and then years later, Fats would do it. "I Hear You Knocking" was originally by Smiley Lewis, and then Fats later did it. "I'm Gonna Be a Wheel." Someday, I think Bobby Marshan may have done it first, and Fats did it. Uh, so it wasn't unusual for them to come back to a track, you know, that someone else had done, and just felt that Fats could give it his own magic and make it a hit again. You know, some of those songs may have been local hits in New Orleans, but not nationally. And then Fats would go ahead and record it and get the big national hit. I think Blue Monday might have been originally by Smiley Lewis as well. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, why don't we uh, identify our favorite Fats Domino s- songs individually? We'll start with Bruce. Uh, I'm not going to say the obvious hits, because other people will. But he did this novelty song called The Rooster Song that I absolutely love. You know, there was an old lady from Houston who had two hens and a rooster. A great track. Try to track it down. And then Bo Weevil is on some of the collections. But those two... Just because there's something so southern in New Orleans about uh, the Rooster Song and Bo Weevil. So I'm going to list those as my favorite ones. An honorable mention will be Raining in My Heart, which is another non-big hit that Fats Domino did uh, from, I guess, the early 60s that I really like. Ken? Uh, I would say it's a cross between My Blue Heaven and I really like Be My Guest. Mm-hmm. It's one of those songs that, you know, there's a couple of verses, that's it, <laughs> and you got the saxes playing their part, and then, you know, before you know it, the song is over and you want to hear it again. And my you Blue know, Heaven, which is, I, think, I think My Blue Heaven was heavily featured in M.A.S.H. on the TV series. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Maybe that's part of the reason. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but there's so many of them. You know, and also, uh, I, I will say that even though I was familiar with Fats' hits, when, when someone like Paul covers them, and I love John's version of Ain't That a Shame, I've really come to love I'm Gonna Be a Wheel Someday, mm-hmm. especially those songs, and I Want to Walk You Home, and you know I'm In Love Again, those versions. And so it makes me appreciate his music even more going back to Fats' originals mm-hmm. of those songs. So, Okay, Steve? I have to. I have two. Uh, one is the Fat Man, because I remember picking up a vinyl copy of his first album um, a long time ago, and and just absolutely loving that song, um, crackles and all on the vinyl. And so yeah. I love that one. But the other one is whole lot of love, and I love the way he, when when you talk about his personality. Bruce and how he mm-hmm. has such a joyful personality. It's all in that song. The way he, the way he does that song, and absolutely. Um, so th- those would be my two choices. Those would can't be argue two. with those. <laughs> yeah. So we're up to me, huh? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is "Ain't That a Shame," but I think I might go instead with a, a, another of the standards, "Blueberry Hill." Just really like it as a record. I like the way he does it. And Mm -hmm. even though it wasn't his song, it's so completely associated with him uh, that even when you run into a 
a post fats cover version of it you think of it as a fats domino song you know but beyond that uh my blue heaven uh i'm in love again love i'm in love again that's a, that's a great track and um yeah i mean there, there really are so many but um i think those would be my my top few yeah i mean like blueberry hill as you you know as we talked about earlier other people did the song but it's Fats' song, just like Twist and Shout. Yeah, we could say the Isley Brothers did it and the, you know, Top Notes did it, but it's the Beatles that really did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The same with uh, Blueberry Hill. Nothing against Louis Armstrong by any means, but... It's kind of the song. difference between writing a song and owning a song, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. yeah. Fats owns Blueberry Hill. And, and as, you know, as, you know, Richie Cunningham and Fats, you know, Doing it, what can I say, you know? <laughs> I, I had forgotten all about that until you mentioned it, Bruce. That was, a, that was great that you mentioned that. Yeah. That whenever was a I think of happy days. Yeah. <laughs> the Me early too. years, anyway. Whenever I think of Blueberry Hill, I immediately think of Ron Howard singing it. Oh, okay. Happy days. Okay. How can you not? He, said it, he sang it a lot in the show. So. That's true. He did. Um, Bruce, have you got any Beatles stuff coming up? Since we normally talk about Beatles... Have you got any Beatle things you can you can mention that any any new book lectures, projects for instance book projects or record record projects in the works that maybe you want to let us know about? No, uh, I can say no more. <laughs> <laughs> say no more. <laughs> say no more. Yeah. Really? I okay. can say, as far as book projects, I, I don't want to be like the Who and say that my Sergeant Pepper book is the last Beatles book I'll ever do, and then you know have another last book and another last book. I think I have no plans of doing additional books on the Beatles, but if a project grabs my fancy, I'll certainly do it. Yeah. And leave it at that. Beatles lecture? <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm not taking suggestions, so I don't want your listeners to email me and say, you need to do a book on the Raha Krishna temple, you know, something like that. <laughs> you realize you're going to get some now. I know. You, real, you realize that. Have Are you, you got any appearances coming up? Not for a spell. I, of course, will be at the uh, Fest for Beatle fans in uh, New Jersey. And uh, for those who haven't been in a while, the new location is great. To put it in proper perspective, when it was in the um, the Meadowlands, uh, I was in a room where my view was, uh, you know, a couple of walls and a dingy ceiling and the toilets gurgled at you and all kind of other things. <laughs> my view from my table last year, and it'll be at the same place, was the Statue of Liberty. So I think that kind of puts it in perspective. Ooh, okay. Huh. That's that's cool. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And so I think we'll, we'll go out and saying that uh, make sure to track down through whatever means you track down your music, uh, be it streaming services or iTunes. Get some Fats Dominoes and do Bruce Spicer a favor. Listen to Fats Dominoes' version of When the Saints Go Marching In as I think the New Orleans Saints are going to be good this year. Okay. Okay. So, Will, thank you for coming along, Bruce. And um, Uh, it was always uh, a pleasure. Any any time you you feel there's a topic that you know makes sense to have me along, don't hesitate to call, and I'll be happy to Skype on in with you guys. Okay. Okay. So, definitely will. Okay. So, if you want to contact us, uh, you can reach us at. You can email us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at, at things we said fab. We have a Facebook page, things we said today Beatles radio fans, and we'll go around and uh, get contact information for everyone, starting with Bruce. My website is very easy to remember www.beetle.net. Okay. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and all that other stuff I don't understand. <laughs> all right. And Ken? And Steve? Um, Beatlesexaminer at gmail.com is where you can email me. I have a Beatles News and Information Facebook page as well as my own personal Facebook page. Um, but Beatles News and Information is where, where I post a lot about Beatles. And I've been posting actually a lot about Fats Domino the past few days. But um, that will probably start to fade but I'll, I'll still do some stuff there but anyway that's where if you want to um, talk about Beatles that's the place to go for me okay and Ken alright you can reach me on my Facebook page at Ken Michaels also my email address which is everylittlething at att.net 
And always make sure you visit my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. I will have another special contest coming up this week, probably by the end of the week, giving away Ken Womack's new book on George Martin called Maximum Volume, The Life and of the Producer. producer. Yes, I love it. I love it. I can't wait till the next one comes out, till the follow-up. And um, I will have three copies to give away, signed by Ken. And the contest, like I said, will start by the end of this week. So that looks to be, what is today's date? Today, uh, November 3rd. Look for it to be starting around then. And then I just want to mention a couple of new CDs. Speaking of George Martin, we talked about this a few weeks ago. There's a brand new CD that came out on the film scores um, and the original music, orchestral music of George Martin, that was done by the Berlin Music Ensemble. And it's coming out on November the 10th, and I actually have CD copies to give away, and that's part of my Beatles trivia and games page. And I also have another legend here to talk about, Roy Orbison. There's a brand new uh, CD coming out on November 3rd. It's called A Love So Beautiful. And what this is, is they've taken Roy's vocal tracks many of them are the original vocal tracks some are not from the past from his classic stuff from the 60s on up and it's being backed by the royal philharmonic orchestra in fact it was recorded at studio two at abbey road so there's a new cd of that coming out like i said it was called a love so beautiful which is the name of one of roy's songs which was on his mystery girl album and George Harrison played on the original. He's not in the backing tracks on the new version. So um, that is coming out November the 3rd, like I said, but you can win that on my website. And uh, there's also a brand new book on Roy Orbison called The Authorized Roy Orbison, written by uh, Roy Sons and Jeff Slate, who we all know writing for Beatle Fan and Rolling Stone and Esquire. And uh, I'm working on getting that to give away as well. But um, you can win the Roy Orbison CD, the George Martin CD, and the George Martin book, all on my website, which is at KenMichaelsRadio.com. I hope you remember all that. (laughs) Okay, so it was great having an opportunity to spend some time listening to Fats' music before, you know, to get ready for this discussion and discussing Fats with Bruce, who uh, lived in his city and saw him few times and um but we're hoping that you know next week when we reconvene we won't be in a position of having to discuss the death of another great rock legend you know we should have a few weeks off now and um so um for ken michaels and steve marinucci this is alan cozen saying thanks for listening and we'll see you next time